Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's special lecture. I'm very pleased to welcome to our virtual podium, Professor Nujat Rahman from the University of Montreal. Professor Rahman is an expert in comparative literature with a focus on Arabic literatures in the plural, aesthetics and politics in comparative post-colonialities. Post She's the author of several volumes, uh, including the very important In the Wake of the Poetic Diasporic Artist after Mahmoud Darwish, uh, Humor in Middle Eastern Cinema, Mahmoud Darwish Exiles Poet, and Literary Disinheritance, which I encourage you all to read, uh, in addition to numerous articles published in some of the leading journals internationally. Tonight, uh, Professor Rahman will be talking about art and power, excuse me, art's future, art's force, women artists envision the future. This lecture is a special event co-sponsored by the New York University Abu Dhabi Institute uh, in conjunction with the Arab Crossroads Studies Program and co-sponsored with the NYUAD Art Gallery. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor to Professor Rahman and note that at the end of her talk, there will be a question and answer period and you can leave any questions or comments in the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will field them um, after the talk. Thank you very much. And welcome again, Professor Rahman. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And uh, I would like to, I'm very honored to be here speaking with you today. And I'd like to thank uh, Professor Shannon, but also NYU uh, at Abu Dhabi for this kind invitation and for this interest in this topic. Um, I will be speaking about um, women artists, uh, Arab women artists, especially, um, particularly two, uh, two artists, uh, Larissa Sansour and Sama El Shabi. So uh, I think I would like to take this opportunity at the beginning uh, just to share with you some of the uh, clips and images that I, I would like to discuss, and then I will return uh, to my talk. So. Um, I will screen, uh, share the screen with you now. Okay, the first image is from in vitro. And um, okay, uh, this is her latest work actually. And I will just increase uh, the volume here. The second segment that I would like to show is uh, from the short film also, uh, In the Future They Ate from the Finest Porcelain. And this is uh, from 2015, whereas the one I just showed is uh, from 2019. And then this last segment uh, from Nation Estate.
will uh, stop the screen now and, and return um, return to you and to my talk. Um, what, what you saw again is uh, in vitro, which is from 2019 of Larissa Sansour uh, in, the, in the future, they ate the finest porcelain, which is from 2015, and Nation Estate, which is uh, about 2009. So I will, um, I wanna talk about these uh, artists, these two specific ones as sort of, um, indicative of a general trend at the same, uh, at the one hand, but also uh, placing them within a larger context of uh, women's art today. So um, first of all, the, I, the one notes that this is an art that addresses uh, itself as an art, its role, and um, also addresses itself in relation to power, in relation to knowledge and the limits of knowledge. Um, it's an art also that uh, uh, intriguingly deals with disasters and catastrophes that are of ecological nature, but also that are general, uh, while at the same time uh, addressing a particular experience. And we see in the videos that it's really emerging from a particular experience. And we could also say that um, there is a certain preoccupation with the temporality, specifically with a vision of the future. So um, if I had to summarize uh, how uh, these spe specific two artists deal with this question, it's as if, the, if there is no intervention in the present, an artistic intervention, the future is that of an apocalyptic uh, past. So of course, apocalypses, as you know, uh, they have a particularly um, uh, mythic, uh, biblical origin, which which means the end of things. So it's it's a announcing a general catastrophe for for humans. But the way that these artists are reworking that is to um, basically insist on an artistic intervention, so that the this kind of dystopic future does not become inevitable. So this question of power and agency through art that is implicit. So uh, first of all, I'd like to um, uh, suggest that art has a unique power to move. And this we all, I think, know and agree on. Uh, but it also extends uh, beyond the limits of knowledge. Uh, and this idea uh, recurs in, in many of the views of uh, critics. For example, the French uh, critic Maurice Blanchot notes the art's relation to knowledge. So uh, if I can quote him for a second, he says, art can succeed where knowledge fails. So they're announcing a certain uh, limit to knowledge. And the films, especially Larissa Sansour's in the future, um, uh, directly addresses uh, knowledge and how art is in relation to knowledge, as we will see. So art can succeed where knowledge fails because it is and is not true enough to become the way and too unreal to change into an obstacle. Obstacle. So precisely because it is not based on um, uh, scientific knowledge that it has uh, this imaginary and this imagination also opens up um, other possibilities. Furthermore, he suggests that persistence and survival may be intrinsic to art. And so art is also necessary to our own persistence. And the films, as you will see, and the artworks uh, are all preoccupied with this question of life and survival and persistence. So art changes its meaning and its sign, according to Blanchot. It, dis it destroys while it survives. That is its imposture, but that is also its greatest dignity. The same that justifies the saying, writing is a form of prayer. And here, if we look at art in a more general, uh, in a broader meaning, uh, we could also uh, suggest that there is this mystical dimension to uh, these works of art, especially in Sama al Shabi, as we will see a little later on. Likewise, Edward Said in Humanism and Democratic Criticism links art to thought, uh, offering art as a provisional home and a tentative refuge for the intellectual. 
And I quote Said, the intellectual provisional home is the domain of an intransigent art into which, alas, one can neither retreat nor search for solutions. But only in that precarious exilic realm can one first truly grasp the difficulty of what cannot be grasped and then go forth to try anyway. And this Said uh, links, of course, art to thought, but also links art to power, since he offers art as intransigent in the face of unjust exercise of power, for example. In both statements, art seems, uh, art, it seems, opens onto a possibility, a moving to an elsewhere, to a new language, a new aesthetic language, to a common language. And so art emerges on the threshold of presence as a fragile force. So if there's, we could say there's, uh, if there's power to art, then it is a fragile force. And an intervention in the present, that is also in its intervention in the present, especially for uh, the historically powerless, for example, as we will see in the women's art later. Art also promises a new form of individual and communal life for critics like, like Jacques Rancière. And Jacques Rancière really uh, links art and aesthetics in relation to politics. So for him, art be, is potentially a displacement of true politics from a depoliticized space into the space of art. So in, this, in these ways, it is an art for future. Uh, for it also presents imagery, according to Charles Tripp, that will shape the present and the future, convincing people that this was the way it was. And so in this, in this last idea, we could see in Larissa Sansur that art becomes really a monument, a monument for memory, a monument that, uh, of imageries and art that testifies in some ways. So contemporary women artists explore this relation of art and power, art and knowledge, art and persistence, but also art and displacement, as I will discuss a little further. Here, I wanna trace uh, my relationship to, the, um, to art, uh, because I, 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 of course, my work is, has, especially my earlier work, is mostly on poetry. So I began to think about art in a more sustained way with the passing away of Mahmoud Darwish, the poet I focused on, uh, when I went, witnessed visual and performance artists engage the poet and his poetry. Since then, I have been witnessing and observing visual artists around the world evoking his poetry. I then began to deliberately consider visual, cinematic, and performance art as visual counterpart to poetry to explore this dialogue and interaction between the two, especially in my uh, last work. And this art uh, of women articulates also an aesthetic founded on loss, on dispersion, we could say, but also on transformation and the possibility of reinvention and uh, transformation toward uh, solidarity rather than identity and towards a future. And of course, the, the thinking of the future, the preoccupation of the future uh, leads, to, uh, leads for us to think the relationship between aesthetics and politics. So our Arab art in general seems to have inherited a legacy of poetry uh, among its other influences uh, of, in, of aesthetics. Women artists are inevitably the inheritors of a long and vibrant tradition of Arabic poetry. And we see Sama al Shabi, for example, evoking uh, a pre Islamic uh, po uh, poetry in her, in her art, um, as, I, as I will show. Kemal Bulata has noted the historically and relatively marginal status of the visual arts in Arab cultures. He writes, Poetry continued to be revered as the supreme form of self-expression. That is partly why the interpretation of metaphors and allegories could only be understood in the context of images that have first been articulated verbally. 
So this kind of interconnection between poetry, poetry and art and visual art um, in, in the way it takes up uh, images and in the, in the common images that um, also they share. So art, visual art in the context of the Middle East and especially, specifically uh, Arab art uh, seems to have continued poetry uh, at the same time that it displaced poetry, of course, because it's, it, it has its own forms. In the works of these women artists, artist creation is one of connection and transformation, I suggest. Critics have also noted a new period of artistic creativity. For example, Charles Streck goes back to the 1970s to locate the shift in the, visibil in the visibility of Palestinian art. Um, and I quote him, Palestinian artists had tried to create public spaces in which their art could be seen. So um, this idea of uh, fashioning or creating a public space where it might not uh, be there as, as much otherwise. Elan Pape also attributes this new period of creativity to what he sees as, quote, a decentralization of the political scene in the 1990s. So this art becomes increasingly transnational, diasporic, but also uh, local. This recent renaissance of Arab art can be seen in its significant presence on the global stage in the last decades, and one could say four decades specifically. Contemporary women artists such as Muna Hatoum have gained uh, wide international recognition as evidenced by prestigious awards, of course, publications on their work, international solo exhibits around the world, and artworks housed in permanent collections as well. So the example, uh, perhaps, of Emily Jasser's Hugo Prize in uh, 2008, um, but also Raida Saade's uh, Arezzo Biennale Award in 2013, and Larissa Sansour's Danish representational exhibit at the Venice Biennale in 2019, and of course in vitro, uh, but uh, the art installation heirloom comes from this last Venice Biennale. Um, so this attention is testimony to the innovation of these artists, but also crucial to the dissemination of this artistic experience that has been historically on the margins. And of course, it implies a wider and ex more extensive experimentation in art that is taking place. Um, Bulata as well identified women's art as tremendously innovative and deserving of substantial critical attention. So in my discussion, of course, I focus on women's art, but of course one could situate them within a general uh, uh, movement of art in the Arab world today. So Arab woman artists such as Larissa Sansour, who was born in East Jerusalem and living in London, and previously resident of Denmark, and Sama El Shebe, who is, was born in Basra in Iraq and living in Arizona. So these visual, performative, and often ephemeral and intermedial artworks employ aesthetic categories uh, interestingly, such as science fiction and speculative fantasy, which is uh, why I focused on these particular artists who really highlight uh, fantasy in their artwork and its significance, of course, to, uh, uh, to a politics of the possible, to uh, new imaginations of the future. So uh, fantasy and its vision of the future, as well as the intriguing accompaniment that we see of poetic mysticism in this art, but also humor and the absurd. So that there's this tension between aesthetic and politics that unfolds, but without one collapsing into um, the other. So in its presence and proliferation, fantasy is a surprising element that surges from an anguish whose nature is historical and expresses what otherwise cannot be expressed. So according to Judith Butler, and I, uh, uh, and I follow her in terms of her thinking about fantasy, 
She argues that fantasy, quote, allows us to imagine ourselves and others otherwise. It allows us to question what has to be. And so in this uh, thinking, fantasy and its employment becomes a way to intervene in the present. So fantasy reveals how realities are open to transformation and it heralds a, po a poetics and a politics of the possible of future of common life, but also of life and its concern for ecology, as in the work of Sana'i Shadi, and in its restructuring of reality, as in the work of Larissa Sansur. So in engaging common life, I ask in my work, as I, I think uh, about this project, is art today the display space, not only for true politics, as Rancière has uh, argued, but also for unhindered thought. And so this link to thought and to knowledge that I am pre uh, that I'm thinking about in these um, art artworks here. Um, displacement in all its valences has drawn these artists to it. Uh, heralded a common space and cast art as an art for freedom and for future. Edward Said has called the artwork of Muna Hattoum, born in Beirut and living in London, an art of displacement. And that is an art that is, quote, restless, offering, quote, no respite in the age of refugees, migrants, and exiles. An art of, uh, an art of displacement also, one could argue, does not settle the relationship between art and power, art and knowledge. Art is not only a displaced space for freedom, we could say, thought and new ways of being in common, uh, but also is itself an art of displacement. That is um, uh, an art that's really, uh, to go back to Rancière, uh, sort of opens up a public space uh, in the space of art. The predicament of being moved by what one sees, feels, and comes to know, according to Butler, is always one in which one finds oneself transported elsewhere. So there is uh, this kind of displacement going on in, uh, in art. Uh, so transported elsewhere into another scene. These artists' innovative use of language is grounded in a reading of history and of the present. And so uh, one could see these artists as also interpreters uh, and readers of the present and of history. This art presents creation as a significant act of interpretation uh, in nationalism, human rights, and interpretation. Edward Said has written compellingly on the fundamental relation between interpretation and freedom, on interpretation as a necessary path to freedom. And I quote, an interpretation for rather than only about freedom. So it's art itself becomes for freedom for inter, uh, in its interpretation and not just uh, taking up the topic of freedom as its subject. So artists as interpreters constitute art as an art for, for the future. And this aesthetic interrogates the task of interpretation today seeking perhaps to reinvest it again ethically as an intervention and as a critical act. Um, art, as we all know, has often been the first to respond to changing realities. And uh, this art then is a hesitant language. It's a becoming. And it seems to show the way to an experiential and intimate knowledge, to a sensorial common cause. This art is no longer simply an individual invention, an object, a material, or an intense sensorial expression. It entails a, a displacement of the artists themselves and their techniques to a common space. These artists are creating out of solidarity, arguing for a common predicament, and so a common human predicament. Uh, and in this, it is also an art of persistence. Art calls into question practices of power that lead to collective conditions of dispossession and displacement, whether it's for ecological uh, reasons or for historical reasons. And so as power is multidimensional, 
women artists are particularly placed to address different dimensions of power that involve, of course, questions of gender as well. While art may not in itself change the balance of power, as Charles Tripp has argued, it is a factor that shapes the environment in which attitudes to power are formed. It can counter the version that may have become part of an unthought common sense. And so in that, again, uh, there is a relationship between art and knowledge, art and thought. So these artists reveal the power of women in art as well as the inseparability of art and power. Also to speak kind of contextually about this art in general, we could say that it's marked by dispersal, that this aesthetic corpus does not relate a unified story or narrative. This art implies continuous transformation rather than identity, and that questions of identity are complicated and nuanced in the way that they represent personal experience, the specificity of time and place, and also um, each artist, we could say, develops her own strategy of resistance to mainstream conventions, uh, mainstream conventions being aesthetic, but also one could say uh, those that are um, social or um, political. So artists grapple with concerns uh, regarding gender, home, genealogy, identity in different ways. And this diversity of artists also manifests in, its, in the use of medium itself, the artistic medium, in the creation of a new language in the visual uh, work of art, uh, such as photography. Uh, we see photography that's historical, that, uh, for example, Larissa Sensu uses historical um, archival uh, footage, uh, but also digital uh, photography and images uh, spatial installation, video, uh, personal performance as well. So in the way also they employ uh, popular culture um, and performance art and art media. So they ultimately reinvent tradition, uh, aesthetic tradition, but also their local traditions through medium, image and language. So more than uh, individual visions, this art has incorporated aspects of global culture to affirm its belonging as it addresses a global audience and as it remains deeply rooted. So the works reveal a tentative, uncharted community of creation. Um, as an art of experience, it also serves in many, in many guises. Uh, affirmation uh, of certain reclamations, vigilance, memory, and healing, as I will show. So I will begin with uh, Larissa Sansour uh, and her vision of the future, uh, based on these works that I showed earlier uh, in my talk. So Larissa Sansour's trilogy, which is often in collaboration with her partner Sor Soren Lind, uh, the trilogy is A Space Exodus, which is a five-minute work in 2009. Nation Estate, which I, I just showed, which is uh, nine minutes um, in 2012, rather than in 2009. It's the, the nine in the 2012 has said. Um, and in the future, they ate from the finest porcelain, which is 29 minutes from 2015. And the latest work from Heirloom, uh, the art installation. Uh, exhibited at the Danish Pavilion um, in 2019. So part of the installation of Heirloom is her short film in vitro or muhtabar in Arabic. So Sansur's artwork, which is composed of this uh, short film, but as I mentioned, this digital photography, it's a videography, uh, but also um, uh, 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 archival footage has been exhibited internationally and explores historical reality through science fiction and dystopic fantasy. It's also like most of her work uh, and the work of other artists, women artists here, it focuses on loss. And in her earlier work, it strikingly uses humor 
And in one, I already dealt with the question of humor in one of my works, that we can see it everywhere in this uh, artistic and cinematic production today uh, that's coming out of the Arab world. Uh, so the use of irony, the absurd, particularly parody, but, and also dark humor to complicate and nuance representation. And this is especially the case in nation estate. Uh, humor, of course, is one could locate it between aesthetics and politics, between aesthetics and power. Uh, humor renews, questions, and contests power. It represents the familiar critically and gives art access to the public sphere as well, for it disrupts norms and it uncovers repressed content, as Andrew Horton has argued. So from the trilogy to her latest work, as has been noted, there is a special, there's a kind of shift from the absurdist to the dystopian, even though um, there is a certain irony that remains always in her, um, in her work. So while dystopia signals an imagined, often cataclysmic decline in the future, whether it's because of environmental or social conditions, recurrent in her work is the conception of art as an intervention in the present to safeguard a future. Uh, in, uh, in the future, for example, the, uh, the main character says, كل أفعالنا تدخل في التاريخ all of our activities or our work is an intervention in history. And in some ways, her art is that intervention. So the aesthetic project is precisely to empower and to transform. Uh, and here again in the future, قدرتنا على التحرك والتحول. So this kind of agency is really through this ability to transform and to, um, to move, uh, that is to act. So while the vision of the future within the artwork itself is dystopic, that is, it's the, the nature of the future uh, represented in these artwork is dystopic, the vision for art itself, the vision for art itself is one of promise and possibility. In all her work, one notes a philosophical reflection on art as an aesthetic and ethical project for a future which takes the form, as I mentioned, of fantasy and science fiction and becomes ex an exploration of politics, uh, of politics, of the politics of the possible. So at the heart of this project, again, is the struggle for persistence, the struggle for life in the condition, in conditions of death, for instance. So persistence is also uh, a quest for an aesthetic form in her work. So, um, we see this uh, preoccupation with, uh, with, uh, with life, with continuation in the aesthetic form, uh, precisely in the reflection of her visual language and in the themes of her work on narrative. So her short film, for example, in the future, The Eight from the Finest Porcelain, presents her project as one of narrative, for the main protagonist declares herself part of a narrative movement. Uh, and I quote, we are depositing facts in the ground for the future archaeologists to excavate, to prove that this people that we are positing existed, unquote. Uh, so she calls for her project again for as an intervention in history. So narrative will be transmitted through herself and beyond herself, this idea that it does not rest with one uh, individual and the dialogue that ensues with an absent interlocutor about her sister's death, uh, that is the protagonist, killed mistakenly at the age of nine, it is suggested that the death could have been hers and that beyond a certain point, death is no longer personal or an individual. So um, I quote again, our collective existence makes us all targets in this narrative of the, video, of the short film. So narrative is importantly collective in its creation. And this also we see in her intertextuality, we could say. That is, she uses images that also evoke other images of, of other artists. For example, in in vitro, uh, the images uh, often hark back to images of uh, Mona Hattoum's work. So there is kind of a larger narrative that is being uh, woven. 
Significantly, her art, her latest artworks often take the form of a dialogue, which makes them poly polyphonic, that is, there are many voices, open-ended, uh, in their reflections and questionings. Um, so the contrapuntal dialogue presents conflicting meanings. It's not about presenting a sole meaning in these videos, but really kind of a reflection and um, uh, meanings that challenge one another. So the dialogue is between two views that challenge one another. However, the dialogue is carried within a process of healing and is integral to it. So whether it's the main protagonist in dialogue with her mother, recovering on her sick bed in in vitro, or her, the protagonist herself undergoing a certain kind of care in, in the future. Also, the protagonist asks uh, in, uh, in vitro, isn't the most radical activity founded on trauma? And here again, this idea of radical as fundamental um, and trauma as kind of the suffering and this quest for survival and for life and for uh, vivaciousness, one could say, in that life. So in this question is an acknowledgement of a collective trauma, whether for historical reasons or ecological ones, and uh, of a conscious reflection on empowering responses to such a trauma, that is, responses that uh, do not implicate violence, but rather implicate a certain imagination um, in responding to uh, uh, ecological uh, violence, for example, or um, historical ones. So the aesthetic project is preoccupied with the possibility of healing in its ethical and political vision. In most of her art, we are presented with uh, a main, char main character who's a young woman and who is trying also to communicate with the past and the future. And uh, again, I propose this idea that um, in fact, the, um, uh, the, the, the past is the future if one does not intervene to change it or to transform it. Uh, and also this idea that um, the, as the main protagonist does not accept the present as a simple waiting between past, uh, between the past and the future. Uh, so this idea that, uh, that the present cannot be just a question of this waiting um, for a return or waiting for uh, things to become uh, livable. Uh, of course, in, uh, I have the image of Muna uh, Hatoum, Mamnu' al Intidar, waiting is forbidden, as uh, kind of a, a work that harks to this in some ways, but also Iman Harams in waiting. And if I have a chance at the end, I will show you those two images. Um, so the, the relationship to, to uh, the past and the future is a relationship to a certain apocalypse. But here again, it's kind of reworked, so it's not inevitable that there is this possibility for intervention. Um, and also the conception of time is one of disappearance. So that kind of uh, apocalyptic vision and, uh, again. So the past uh, is now and will disappear, this idea that we are living in a time of disappearance as um, in vitro shows. Uh, okay. In in vitro, and I will speak about this, uh, I think to also make sure that I do not uh, pass too much my time here. Um, we are presented with an ecological disaster. And importantly, again, this ecological disaster in the short film is really kind of general uh, all over the earth. And so there is a planetary kind of conception and preoccupation with the predicament of humans in general, first of all, but also uh, anchored in a particular moment uh, um, and a particular uh, place since we have images of Bethlehem. So uh, this ecological disaster is likened also to a plague in the Old Testament. So by anal analogy, the disaster, one could say, is mythic and by implication also historical because we see a storm, we see a departure, we see images of refugees uh, and of collectivities. 
the opening shot, uh, which is a wide shot of a street in Bethlehem. So we recognize the, uh, the traits of the place. Uh, and in the, uh, we see kind of the camera backtracking and showing us an ecological unleashing where streets and uh, buildings and so forth uh, succumb to this uh, calamity. Uh, and in this uh, uh, video also, we see an underground uh, bunker so that life has sort of continued but has been displaced to an underground uh, bunker that is kind of a time of waiting until there, a re-emergence takes place. And in this underground uh, uh, structure, there is a monument for a lost time, which is the spheric, uh, uh, spheric uh, uh, I can sh show it to you, but it's a, it's a kind of a big ball that uh, represents or stands for memories of a place and memories of a different time. Uh, so we see, which is the segment I showed you, um, I think I, I, I did show the, um, uh, um, uh, the opening, which is the monument for a last time. We see images of an interior of a traditional house, for example, with open windows, uh, a staircase, a girl looking out onto the balcony, an exterior landscape. And again, uh, you know, the houses are the traditional houses that we could find in Bethlehem. Um, the, the, the places, the marketplace, the church, the, the hills, kind of all hark back to a particular place, but like I mentioned, always in like with uh, uh, a more universal predicament. Exchanges then follow between two women interlocutors, how about facts alone will not create collective visions and understandings, uh, that facts may be too sterile, or that facts perhaps with time uh, become the usual facts. And so in this, there's a direct valorization of aesthetics, of art, of the imagination, um, and that the film reaffirms art art's relation to knowledge uh, and to power, um, as it posed also the, this kind of juxtaposition between archeology span and history. So history, which is factual based on facts and scientific exploration, um, in some sense uh, uh, is not the one that's creating myth and certain realities in the present, but rather it's archeology span itself. And so in the future, uh, it is uh, precisely uh, this work of narrative, which is also a work of uh, constructing uh, um, a certain archaeology for the future. Okay, so there is an intersection between myth, ecological dystopia, and political allegory, as well as this uh, um, uh, an imaginary for a future. So in vitro also has an oneric quality containing the dream of the main character, which is narrated to her interlocutor and is presented visually. The dream of these two interlocutors is uh, a shared one, that of an olive harvest. Uh, so a dream of the past, but also of uh, a return that is deferred and one that they want to guard as a memory and as a future. Uh, we see also an image of a suitcase in the middle of the olive grove, which suggests, of course, that um, a memory of departure, uh, but also a collective dream of persistence that's linked to dispersion, to exile, uh, which is at the very heart of this experience of home. But the experience of home is now accented, one could say, by this dispersion and by this experience of exile and dispossession. So a displacement is evident in her work, for example, where the olive tree is now inside the apartment, as I showed that image earlier on from a state nation, where we see in the apartment this olive tree that she's watering. And in some sense, then in the last, let's say, uh, of, of that uh, in, in history, uh, uh, for some that it is displaced now um, in this um, um, interior place and in the underground bunker. The underground bunker visually is all about concrete and structure and it even looks like this kind of prison structure of several floors where the center holds a void. 
But there is also um, underground um, an olive grove and uh, uh, fig trees and, and, and uh, particular trees uh, identified with a certain place. And so um, in this, in this uh, imagination, there is also this kind of displacement going on that is guarding a memory, but also uh, inscribing a certain persistence. Uh, it's interesting to, to return to the, the term dystopia, which is in Greek means a bad place. And in Lar Larissa Sansur's visual language, we see a lot of places. Uh, and here, the places, of course, with a certain place, that is Bethlehem and its surrounding uh, areas and hills and olive groves and so forth, which is the exterior uh, landscape. But also um, this place of supposedly the future of home, which is linked more with what Mark Oje has uh, suggested as non lieu or places of non-attachment, places of passages, which are no places really, such as um, in nation state, we see elevators, escalators, lobbies, um, uh, hallways, and so forth. And so the exterior of these places, uh, the underground bunker, are all non places in which these characters uh, uh, find themselves, interiors of buildings. Uh, and so her visual language is marked again by, uh, uh, by all of this, but also emphasizes uh, the, these ecological disasters uh, and then the, kind of the dark sky and uh, the futuristic attire and so forth. In vitro, for instance, um, we see these, uh, uh, also these, how the underground actors uh, have introduced a beehive to uh, above, uh, to restart a life cycle. And so this idea also, uh, even as a theme of this persistence and a looking toward the future looking to uh, a return. The sense, the sense of aesthetic obviously is visual and sound uh, and so forth, but what's uh, also intriguing in her, in, in, in her artwork is this recurrent gesture of touching, um, this kind of tactile uh, aesthetic, which is, uh, this, uh, reflects this uh, effort to grasp, to connect with this past, with its nature, with its loved, uh, lost loved ones, with its, the disappearing, uh, present and past. And so we see the young girl in, uh, in, uh, in vitro who uh, oftentimes has this, uh, touches the stones, touches the uh, surroundings, the sensilas, the her mother's hands, uh, the, you know, tries to grasp the monument uh, for a lost time, etc. cetera. Um, in, in the future, uh, the Eight from the Finest Porcelain, it explores the role of myth in history again. And there's a dream of a dystopic future as well. Uh, we see these futuristic vehicles taking off in a dark and menacing sky in an empty landscape. And uh, a woman approaches in this futuristic attire. And oftentimes she, but also other characters, look at us directly uh, at the camera as, and the viewers as if to address and implicate the viewers as well. Um, also the image I showed you is we see this kind of sunlight over a limestone village or, or city in the distance and, and olive groves and hills again, which we uh, attribute to a certain place. And we see this porcelain that's falling from the sky, like first like rain, then the storm, then um, kind of like a catastrophe. And so there, there is uh, in this film, both the, the falling of the porcelain is both the announcing of an apocalyptic future kind of, and an intervention to ensure a future for uh, the main character will be, will be planting uh, these porcelains um, in the ground for future generations to find. Uh, and to excavate. And so uh, again, uh, she calls this a biblical plague, but also an image in my imagination. Um, and often in these images, we see a conflation of peoples, for example, that have passed through this place and as part of this landscape, such as um, uh, 
see almost that like I would call them Islamic scholars from ancient times, but also others in colonial uh, dress. So um, the film also proposes that a certain loss has been aesthetic in addition to being material. Um, in, uh, um, uh, and I cite senses of smell, sound, views, the very sense of motion are taken away, are gone. Uh, so th this kind of loss and this kind of, uh, that la launches this kind of mission to guard the memory, but also uh, to create a visual language uh, to communicate with the future, but with others uh, is precisely, the, it has as its center uh, the aesthetic and these, uh, the safeguarding of these sounds and the smells and uh, that one connects to the past, one connects to the place. And so in this sense, uh, the bereavement and the reclaiming of history is foremost undertaken through the artistic imagination. And I quote, our existence determines the imagination imposed on us. So in this, there's a dynamic relationship also between imagination and uh, history. Um, and so the creation of new visions and new futures requires memory and imagination beyond the usual uh, facts. Um, uh, Nahid, I'm not sure how I'm doing on, on time. I'm sorry, um, Professor Shannon. Uh, there is also, I wanted to discuss uh, Silsila, but perhaps I can summarize rather than uh, uh, give, you know, depending on how much time I have. You can take a few minutes to summarize that. I think that'll be fine and wrap things up. Okay. Um, well, in, uh, in uh, Samal Shaibi, um, uh, the, the artwork Silsila, um, which means uh, a series or continuity, and it's uh, a series from 2009 and on. First of all, there's an evocation again of um, the artist as uh, in some way linked to uh, um, an ancient poet, a pre-Islamic poet, who sort of also stops in, on his desert journey and looks, uh, surveys the place and laments the absence of those, um, those gone and their traces and so forth. So there's a direct uh, uh, evocation of that in al muallaqat one of the images, which means suspended, like suspended poems, um, and the artist herself who undertakes a desert journey that links uh, the region of the Middle East and North Africa and the Maldives. And so the journey that traverses desert and traverses um, uh, bodies of waters and so forth, and in some sense, the, the visual images themselves show us sort of a beautiful uh, nature and uh, sublime nature. And um, at the same time, uh, it, there is a certain idealization of this nature, almost nostalgic, that harks back to what may have been and what could be again. So this is just a, juxtaposed to, again, a sort of uh, um, visualizing um, uh, or, or, or making visible uh, through her artwork uh, certain ecological disasters in the sense of uh, more incremental uh, uh, impending disaster in the sense of like growing uh, desertification, for example, as a future uh, challenge. So in this, uh, there is again this preoccupation of art in relation to survival and to life and to persistence, but also um, this imaginary of what could be that um, we, have, um, we have the possibility of intervening in the present to, uh, to create uh, um, an ecologically sound reality and sound uh, future. So um, uh, this, it's calling attention to the transformation uh, of what's happening. And uh, I'll, I'll show you some of the images, perhaps as uh, uh, just to get a sense of, uh, uh, of, her, of her work. So I will uh, share the screen uh, now and uh, try to um, leave you with, with these images. So here we see this first image, Ecologies of Absence uh, from Silsila, 
uh, which is Fantasy Island. So the, the, the theme of fantasy and the preoccupation of fantasy is certainly, uh, is certainly there. Uh, um, this next image suspended uh, that we see, like the ma'allaqat that I evoked, but also the path, which again could be read mystically as well. Um, so that there is this uh, kind of uh, quest for uh, transcendence and uh, for continuity, when one could say, or unity, that is also uh, beyond just the historical or the uh, uh, so silsila here, this kind of uh, posture of prayer is very much uh, evident, but also here in the use of candles. And, um, and this image uh, of the artist, um, unless weeping, which recalls again, uh, uh, this kind of uh, the desert journey that is uh, also kind of a figure of a certain uh, mourning in the absence uh, of, um, of those that were that were present, and so it, it, there there are several dimensions here: the ecological, the, the historical, the, uh, the certain imaginary, but also linked to a certain mysticism. So I will I will stop here, um, and I'll be happy to ask uh, to to um, to answer any questions you may have regarding these uh, what I've presented. Thank you very much, Professor Rahman. That was an excellent, very rich discussion of uh, some fabulous artwork. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a, an interesting conversation going forward. Thank you again for sharing all that. We actually have a comment already. Uh, just as a reminder to uh, our audience members, you can click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen and type in some questions. We've already had a number of comments saying how uh, evident your passion is for this. And thank you for no questions, just comments and how much they enjoyed the, the presentation and uh, how illuminating it has been. There's a question here. I'm, I'm also happy to see some of my students on the roster list, and this may be coming from one of them. I think I know who you are. And it is, it says, hello, I have a general question about art. Uh, do you believe that art is something that can be praised and interpreted despite the author's intention, or the artist's intention, and what the artist really intends her or his work to be? What is the role um, of interpretation? What is the role exactly. of, of uh, intentionality, in other words? That's an excellent question. Um, uh, certainly, that <laughs> is, uh, the, the, you know, the artworks are open for interpretation and they're very rich and there are different dimensions of reading here. Again, uh, one could read them in terms of um, uh, the ecological, for example, or for um, uh, uh, more for their form, their intermediality, their, um, uh, and so I think definitely the artworks point to that. Um, uh, of course, uh, I am one particular reader, and so I presented a sort of reading, but uh, what was more importantly interesting for me is that they are actually uh, presenting the question of reading and interpretation and knowledge uh, very much in the works themselves, without necessarily foreclosing how we should read them, uh, but that it's uh, uh, there's a certain reflection on art itself as they undertake art, and to kind of situate it uh, between different different areas. Uh, so I, I, I look at it in those terms. Um, very good. Thank you so much for that response. Another question has just come in from Camilla. Does the tradition of poetry you referred to that visual art comes out of and extends, does this include many female poets? And if so, would you be able to mention some? Okay, thank you for that. Definitely. Um, I think, uh, you know, of course, the female poet that's most celebrated and that's most known is Al Khansa in pre Islamic uh, poetry. Uh, and here I'm thinking of uh, Sam al Shebe. But uh, um, uh, and that is particularly, uh, at least for me, relevant in the sense that it's, it's about loss and mourning, but it's also about uh, kind of uh, a certain voice that connects to other voices, to a collectivity, to collective predicaments in that sense. So, um, you know, in, when I began to think about art and poetry in, rela in relation to one another, uh, I, of course, had Mahmoud Darwish, and there, there's, there are a lot of um, different examples one can point to. I even uh, found uh, 
a group of a collective artists in Colorado that uh, are very much, uh, uh, that, that, that are not necessarily connected, let's say, to the Middle East, that also were evoking Mahmoud Darwish. But uh, like we see here, it's also like the, the, the ancient uh, poetry and just because there's um, a long tradition that they, um, the, it is one of the dialogues and not the sole dialogue, obviously, for these artists. Yeah, excellent. That's great. And a really wonderful question in response to it. Uh, the role of women artists um, throughout time is something that's very important in, in the Arab world, even though people uh, stereotypically tend to ignore that or um, overlook it. Um, and poetry, of course, as Diwan al Arab, as this very famous um, aspect of Arab uh, sensibilities, um, uh, has had major uh, women interveners from the prior to the rise of Islam until today. So that's a really excellent question. And, and it's interesting to think of how the visual arts were extensions of some of the poetic sensibilities. And you explore that in your work, uh, your most recent book, and uh, uh, they're really fascinating um, and thought provoking. Some other questions just come in as well that are, um, uh, I don't know if you want to respond to what I just said, uh, or if you want to go to the next question. No, absolutely. I'm, uh, I think that's wonderful what, how you um, uh, also kind of uh, incorporate, uh, remind us really uh, of that, because it's, it's, it's something that uh, we think of visual art, of course, as more contemporary. And so um, it's, it's also in dialogue of a long uh, tradition of poetry. So we have another uh, interesting question coming in from Femto. This is a, a sort of physics question about Larissa Sansour's in the future we lead from fine porcelain. May I ask if you find it appropriate to interpret the flying porcelain plates in the air as flat curved space-time objects? And could this be a critique on our current worldview or to, to draw on your earlier discussion of temporality, could this be a, some sort of way of, of reconceptualizing space-time? That's a sort of mathematical, physical uh, question, but it, uh, there it is. <laughs> from okay, I, mu I must say I am challenged by physics. So um, I think what I would uh, uh, what I would suggest here is that yes, it's it's not a, it, it, this idea that, that it's not like we have a distinct uh, <clears throat> period of um, past, present, and future, but rather an engagement really with the question of like. Uh, that the present can't be just this, it can't be just the state of uh, void or waiting or stasis, but that it's very much an engagement uh, uh, with, with history, but also um, an, uh, an effort to fashion a future. And this idea, again, that um, if we don't really uh, intervene, let's say, in our present, then it's uh, this idea, at least for Sansur, that the, the future will look like the past in the sense of this time of disappearance, this time of um, uh, incremental uh, loss, but uh, uh, also um, uh, certain calamities, really. So, yes, there is from, at least I see it that way. I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, that's getting it. It's also important in, in vitro or that the, the daughter is actually um, like a clone of a of a past girl and sometimes lives to, in, in the case of this movie, uh, the short film, to uh, young adulthood, but other times she didn't make it. They just keep recloning her and implanting memories because that's so, as the mother says on her, or on her bed, that this is a very important way of preserving memory so that we have a future. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's a, a different, interesting way to get back to Femto's question that, you know, space time in, in her works, which are sort of uh, science fiction, and we know that uh, the sort of science fiction genre is relatively recent in Arabic letters, but also in, in film. So this is really interesting provocation as well, that the space and time are reconfigured in this, so that the, the mother and daughter um, are have a very interesting relationship over time, because the daughter's mm -hmm. been reborn many times. I think, I forget if it was 12 times or something in the movie there. I can't remember the exact detail, but that's a fascinating uh, conjunct to uh, the earlier question. More questions just come in. Uh, uh, da, da, da. Are art and beauty essentially related? Art and beauty. This is a long question that, <laughs> that has exercised the greatest minds in philosophy for centuries, but uh, 
if you can maybe give your opinion on art and beauty since you're related. And then a follow-up is, are there any specific artworks that, that you like the most amongst these here personally? Oh, okay. Uh, no, thank you. Um, I think, um, yes, I mean, there's a whole his, uh, history of aesthetics, right? Uh, of defining art as beauty, art as harmony. And so there's this notion of that and uh, Shebi's uh, work a little bit. But uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that the notion of art is also uh, being transformed by these artists in the sense of that the art is more experiential. Uh, that the art is more, there's a certain uh, kind of, uh, there's a certain art that's more intimate or personal, if we could say, but it's also uh, very much linked to uh, not only collectivities, but that there's a sense that we're creating together, that there's a, a collaboration going on. So um, I think the, the sense of uh, the notion of art definitely is being transformed. Uh, by these individual arts artists, but uh, uh, certainly the um, uh, even you know even the historical uh, sense of aesthetics is being evoked and reworked. I think in Alshabi's uh, art here, for instance, that is uh, that these um, uh, this creation is very much a self conscious creation of. Um, uh, of beauty as uh, as an ideal, but also as uh, as a way to uh, kind of um, uh, transform uh, a certain reality. So, um, at also the you could say it's it's different from a history of aesthetic because it is very much um, uh, involved or reflecting on different disciplines and different. Uh, 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 in dialogue with 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 the with the non-artistic, uh, such as uh, fields like uh, archaeology or history and so forth. So excellent. excellent response. I like that. Here's a question from Miriam, one of my students. Do you think that art can have different impacts in different contexts? And if that's the case, is that problematic, or is that something that actually gives us hope? Um, if art has different impacts, sorry, I am. Um, yeah, so if art might have different impacts in different contexts, so the same work of art in a different context may have a very different impact from, this goes back to the question of intentionality that we raised earlier. Wrong. Is this something that's a, a, perhaps a problem or is this actually hopeful? Does this um, offer new spaces or opportunities for, for um, you know, re, reorganizing the sensible, to borrow from Ranciere, for example? Okay, <laughs> excellent. Thank you. No, that's a great question. Um, definitely, that that uh, for, you know, with with different context of viewing of reading, that uh, one could say that the artwork also transforms, right? It's not, uh, but at the same time, uh, we could say that uh, um, from these different contexts, there is definitely this idea of coming to a common space for this art. So it's not uh, it's not an art that wants to stay in its own. Um, particular, uh, you could say, cultural context, but that is, is certainly uh, uh, in dialogue. Um, and the, the, the forms themselves, like science fiction uh, and uh, fantasy allows for this, right? So that it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's uh, reaching out. And, uh, and I, I, I think this is very much, um, a possibility and uh, very important because um, it is trying in some ways, uh, and then I have Rancière also in my mind, that is in, in places where there is, uh, where there's no access, let's say to public, to a public, to a common space, that art allows for that uh, in a sense. And so, um, uh, and I think that that is the quest of these artists and, uh, in a way, the response to that art globally kind of reinforces this idea that they've, um, they've been trying to establish a common language and that there are actually these works kind of test, uh, are, are doing that, I think. Beautiful. I like the quote uh, you said that this is a way of forming a, quote, tentative, uncharted community of creation, end quote, which is quite a beautiful way of thinking about how these artists are working. 
uh, in dialogue, but it's a dialogue that you, you argue is contrapuntal. Um, and that raises, of course, Edward Said's notion of contrapuntal reading uh, for, in his case of colonial texts, uh, Conrad in particular and others. How, is, how are these artists engaging in a contrapuntal dialogue in a sort of post-colonial setting? And how is this dialogue impacted by gender, for example, as well as generation? These are also themes that are very evident in the, in the censure films uh, uh, and amongst other works as well. Uh, this is a really wonderful question. Um, I think, well, I'll begin with the, within the art, uh, the work of arts themselves. So in, in vitro, for example, we have uh, kind of uh, two women that are engaging in this uh, dialogue. And uh, they differ on the, the question of how identity works, or at least um, and, and how, um, uh, for example, they, they consider the past, the, 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 the way they look at memory, et cetera. So they're not, uh, I, I wouldn't say radical differences, but there are different nuances to how they uh, consider these things. And so they, they, they are challenging in a constructive sense each other uh, to build uh, on understanding. And so um, in the future as well, um, uh, there's kind of a therapist figure with the main character and she, she's asking, well, uh, you know, what are you trying to do? Is this constructive for you, for example, to be, to announce yourself as, um, uh, you know, as some sort of militia, narrative militia, et cetera. Uh, and so there are these questions posed about how do we respond? What's best, what's the best way to respond, uh, et cetera. But I think uh, the artworks themselves are in this kind of dialogue around questions of archaeology and history, uh, around questions of uh, dispossession and, uh, um, and exile. And so I think that's implicit uh, in, in, the, in the works, uh, that there's uh, a reaching out to an international audience and posing these questions. Uh, and so there's that. Um, and it's not an oppositional. I mean, contrapuntal also this idea that we um, uh, you know, what may seem as kind of oppositional, but that we can kind of in a musical fashion sort of, um, um, you know, um, have that's these great. voices uh, together. Yeah, that's great. The uh, multivocality of those pieces is evident, even when there's only two um, actors um, in in vitro, for example, there are lots of other voices that, that are, are coming through. That's wonderful. Also, like, I want to point out that Anne-Marie also like the phrase, that these artists are working in a quote, an effort to fashion the future, that this future orientation is very important. And this is a common theme in tonight's conversation is temporality and how all these works are playing with our sense of the present because of these great anxieties we have over the future, given the, the challenges of the Anthropocene, of climate change, of war um, and dispossession and, mm -hmm. and forced migration. Um, and so you see that these women artists in particular are not only um, we've moved well beyond resistance, as you point out in your work uh, and, and, uh, on Palestinian art after Mahmoud Darwish, to this question of, of solidarity and uh, urgency um, and care, self-care, but also community care. So these are very important themes. I just wanted to highlight them. Um, Another question from Steve Kranz, who left a, 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 a nice comment earlier, just thanking you for the presentation. He says he's teaching in a business college here. He's wondering how he might use art to improve his teaching and reaching out to what are mostly female students in his environment and how the arts might be a bridge, to, uh, a form of dialogue to enrich teaching, even in subjects that are not uh, arts based, like business, for example. Okay. Um... I don't know, that's a, that's a really inter an interesting question. And um, I know, for example, um, uh, I teach in a literature department. And so oftentimes I use art uh, in connection with a short story or with a poem. Uh, and uh, in this way, you can see, uh, uh, you can, you can um, make links between different forms, but also even, in, um, I think, you know, the classes in the business world, which could be seen as, um, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, preoccupation, let's say, with questions of persistence today uh, uh, is, is there um, 
everywhere. And so I think these these themes uh, definitely link to that. But also um, uh, in terms of questions of uh, gender that we're getting, uh, uh, not only the perspective of women artists, but oftentimes the, the way that they think about power is, um, uh, is interesting because again, it's this multi-dimensional kind of power, but also power that uh, is not uh, just kind of an opposition, but uh, you know, as a space of, um, uh, that allows or that the way where there could be interventions, where there could be uh, changes made by, uh, by uh, certain, um, uh, uh, certain interventions. It's difficult, to, uh, perhaps, I mean, it, it, the, the question of, uh, it's not so much applicability perhaps than uh, putting works in dialogue with other fields and with other, uh, with other thinking. So uh, oftentimes uh, these, uh, these artworks allow for, for discussions on interpretations on uh, how the characters, for example, construct themselves and refashion themselves as well. So um, yeah, I, I have to think about that. I think it's a, it's a question that's uh, um, definitely, uh, you know, I, I've thought about it within the general humanities, but I think also to think, in, to think of art in relation to fields that are not necessarily not within, uh, uh, classically within the humanities. Yeah, this is a perennial question that we face, those of us working in arts and humanities and trying to translate some of these concepts um, to other domains. That's one challenge. Another challenge is how to, to use the arts as a way of talking about entirely different domains of experience. And so uh, you've given some really nice hints about that. Um, and I'm just wondering if there are any other questions um, from our audience members? We have another comment from Sabrina saying, within the contrapuntal, there is a musicality between the voices. And she loves that remark. So a lot of just uh, laudatory remarks to the oh, okay. um, of your language and your commentary. Uh, they, they appreciate it very much. Probably have time for another question or so. Anybody else want to type one in quickly? Uh, I know some of my colleagues are hiding in the participants list there. Don't hold back. Uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, here's another comment from Carol Martin, of course, Professor Martin. Female students can have a unique way of signaling that they want to participate, engage given circumstances of the subject at hand, the number of women in the field and the positions they hold are good ways to get women engaged. Um, and uh, Anne is saying, thank you so much for talking about poetry. It's been a wonderful talk. And uh, I'd like to just conclude with a couple of remarks. I encourage everybody um, who's interested in, to learn more about Professor Rahman's work to, to read uh, her work in the wake of the poetic Diasporic Artist After Darwish, that was her last work in 2015, and an early important work as well, Literary Disinheritance, The Writing of Home and the Work of Mahmoud Darwish and Asya Jabbar, two very important, two pillars of, of contemporary um, or you know, 20th century uh, Arabic letters. And um, actually, I had the pleasure of meeting Mahmoud Darwish once in Damascus in 1997. I did not meet okay. Asya Jabbar, uh, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's still a very strong memory. Uh, what a great personality, what an amazing poet. Um, I want to thank you again, Najat, for an excellent talk. And I want to remind our audience members that um, we have, uh, this is the second in our series, uh, joint uh, lecture series between Arab Crossroads Studies and the NYU AD, NYU AD Institute, on um, Art and Power in the Middle East, Past and Present. Our next speaker will be Professor Krista Salamandra from the City University of New York. Uh, Monday, 16th of November, her talk will be called The Right uh, to the Ruins, Fictional Media Production and the Syria Con Syrian Conflict. So please stay tuned for that. And uh, I know Krista was watching tonight. I'm sure she's excited by what she just heard and, we're gonna, and seen, and we're going to be very excited to welcome her in November. And there are many other wonderful events um, at the NYU AD Institute, so please uh, check that out on the website. And uh, we've gone virtual, but it's still extremely engaging. And uh, thank you again, uh, Najat, for joining thank us tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah. We look forward to a time where we can welcome you here with a great uh, Abu Dhabi Ahlan wa Sahlan in person, <laughs> inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you so much for having me.